Jeg synes, det er det der. Ja, det er der. What's going on, man? So you have something about you bought your suit? I bought some suits. You bought some suits? Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, I bought some suits. see the suit? Uh, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can And then they, with the help of AD, and the UK class, everybody can work with flyers. So what do you think? I love it. Yeah. I, I got a video because they were playing uh, music, so I got it to the beat. I'll send it to you. Oh, okay. AD's flyers, business flyers, my flyers, Paradise flyers, people trying to hear. I mean, uh, AD's a mint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Comic books, great. AD doesn't have anything that's in. Less than excellent Yeah, like, you know how the comic books are like they grade them, like you yeah. know, at the mall, you know, it's like, it's like, like pristine. Like, yeah, you know, like, yeah, so we come down here for a little bit, you know. Yeah, no, right. And we, before you leave, we have to talk about All right, and then I got to go, uh, Oh, you know, I still have my Cortezes. You do? Yes, I do. Those would be better than the spike days. The ones in that picture? Because you're wearing them in those pictures with the Tony Tom. Yeah, uh, I think so. Yeah, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. where, where was both your birthday party? With the red flyer. Uh, yes, exactly. But you got all the flyers on the floor. Yep. That was, uh, yep, I have that. Lunchbox for third grade? Um, um, my family, we, we, we couldn't afford we'll lunch boxes. We'll we couldn't afford lunch boxes, my family. Maybe your family had lunch boxes. So, uh, Mr. Are you ready to kick this off? Yeah. All right, so, so you step up there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, get up. and you can introduce us, and we're gonna, we're gonna do our thing. Welcome to those who come, and we can we, we're live with the people. Camera, Prime Minister Pete Nice here at 98 Orchard Street, Legacy NYC. We put together this 50 years of hip hop flyers, probably the most comprehensive exhibition of the artistry of Phase Two. Buddy Esquire, Anthony Riley, Danny T, all these artists, and we're bringing Easy AD in here with Martha Diaz to talk about archiving flyers and about the history of Easy AD, who is the most incurable collector, he's obsessive, he's a hip-hop porter in the best way. He even saved, I think, 
some of his braids from Harlem World, from <laughs> July 5th, 1981. He's got the battle braids. So, did you bring one of the braids today? No, it's hair, not okay. braids. <laughs> so, Simon, you want to hold that for me? Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm Let's that. do a round of applause. For those of you who are taking the time out of your day to come, we definitely appreciate you. And those of you who love the culture of hip-hop, it's way more than what you can imagine it is. Uh, most of you uh, who are here, obviously, um, Martha and myself has been friends over three decades. Uh, hip-hop is like a family. Um, and also, um, what's your name? No, Pete. Pete, <laughs> Pete, Pete has uh, been after my archive, and I want to welcome my hip hop brother, Mr. JDL, is in the building from the Coker's Brothers, is here. Welcome, JDL. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you kick it off. I can, I can go. No, so I, well, I, can I say, let me introduce you, introduce the conversation. But um, this is such an honor and privilege to, to be able to even have this conversation. And so, thank you, EZ, and thank you, Pete for an amazing exhibition. And thank you all for coming, and our apologies for not having uh, seats for you. Um, <laughs> we could do it downstairs, but it'll be, you'll miss the, the presentation. So we'll, we're gonna be as quick as possible, and then we're gonna stick around. So if you wanna talk to easy, easy, personally, one-on-one, -on -one, he's mm -hmm. gonna stick around. So, also, before we get started, is there anything that you would like us to talk about? Because I, I want to get that out of the way before we, you know, we ramble on and go off. We want to answer some of your questions, like. Quanto. Yeah. What? 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 Why are you here? What do you want to hear? What? What? What is what you on your about? mind? Yeah. Hi, Allegra. <laughs> Okay, obviously you don't want to, want to, I want to see one of AP's suits for oh, all you, the world. You can do that before you even start. You wanna, yeah, you got to pop out. Sure, show sure. me. Yes. So, so, I okay, like, so, oh, so, I like, oh, I like green. So, I'll send this up a little bit. So, a, AP's collection includes yeah. flyers, includes multimedia, cassettes, video, CDs, um, images, photography. Um, and artifacts like these suits, which he's going to share with us, and and like Pete said, you know, he even kept his hair. So talk about a collector. How many of you collect? Right here. Uh, yes. Collector. Yes. We got some real collectors in the house. Well, all right, thank you. Well, this suit is um, is a suit that we wore, that we had made. Uh, we all got suits made for when we. Um, uh, when we, were, we did a song called Punk Rock Rap. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a suit that we wore for Punk Rock Rap. Also, this is a suit that I wore when we went to Japan mm -hmm. on a Wild Style tour. Mm -hmm. So this is a jacket, madam, yes. and these are the pants. And you see, it's the Superman colors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so these are the pants, and you know I can still fit them actually. <laughs> <laughs> And I do have, we have, and I had red boots. So at a particular time, um, when this was being made, there was a lot of uh, uh, Rick James uh, was kind of on, on hot at a particular time, and you know that kind of style was in play, uh, things like that. Um, was this customized? Absolutely, it was custom made. Um, so the, the interesting thing about um, collecting is that people people value things only in the present tense. They only value it at at the beginning, like when they see it, they have it, they value it, then they forget about it. Mm. So those people who collect value things for a long term, whether it's people, because some people value people for a long term, whether it's a piece of paper, whether it's your puppy, whether it's your cat, we value things for a long term. So we, so that's what I'm, I'm a collector. And I don't actually have the braids, I have the hair. So my sister used to do my hair, and I always, I always save my hair in socks. Um, that's a cultural thing, those are you know, on the ground. Mm -hmm. Know that you know, but then anyway, this is one of the suits, and we just want to share. And what year? Uh, it was 1983, I think. 1983. 1983. So this is one of the suits. It's a. It still smells like smell like leather. It still <laughs> smells. <laughs> it smells. Real it, smells it still smells. Yeah. It smells. So I keep my stuff really clean. I'm a very um, prestigious person. I'm um, everything that I do. I'm very um, 
I'm very orderly, meaning that I keep everything in order. Um, because if you, when you keep things in order, you use less of your brain power to either find them, or locate them, and stuff. And you use your brain power to do other things other than search for things. And that's why I like order. Um, so anyway, that's it. You know, so I'm, I'm a, how many how many pieces of apparel do you have? Oh, I, I mean, I'm gonna say yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I don't really know. I really don't know how many pieces I have because I really have never ever really gone through gone through my my collection. And I could just share. I'm gonna skip around and share some stories. So. When we used to have shows, uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm EZAD from the legendary Cold Press Brothers. And those of you who are in the modern age who um, listen to records and who got into hip hop when records were being created, you might know a line from a famous MC. His name is Jay Z. And he said, I'm overcharging for what they did to the Cold Press Brothers. So, Cold Press, he didn't say brothers, like in hip hop, you don't say the full thing. So, we used to. At, Back in the early days of hip hop, we used to have contests where it was a it was a DJ e battle or an MC battle, mm -hmm. and the winner would get a trophy. And in my group, we had six people, mm -hmm. so they would only get one trophy. So I used to always ask them. I said, "Dude, give me the trophy. I'm gonna hold on to it, and we will always have it." But it wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. One person would take the trophy or the award and leave it in the cab. <coughs> And I was so I used to be so upset because I could have I could I could have it like today. Mm -hmm. When we go through the items, you'll see um, at one of the exhibits, um, I have I think three trophies there. One is uh, the 1982 Harlem World. One is a 1981 Harlem World, and then the one is just a plaque. And the reason why I wanted to collect uh, collect our stuff is because I didn't I knew that I wanted the history to be reserved for if I have children or just, you know, just like things like that. No one knew that, you know, the his, hip hop will, hip, the culture hip hop will be this explosive. But by laying down that foundation, I just wanted to make sure I had a piece of what I, not me, but collectively what the brothers did, um, just for my, for me, mm -hmm. myself. That was a selfish thing, but I, it was important to me. So, and so there you go. Well, it's amazing that you did that because you held on to this, and you actually created the first hip hop archive. Oh, oh! Can I can I go down here? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, but wait, actually, before you do that, no, and, we're, and, and we're gonna and we're going to um, sure. talk more about the Schomburg. But I want to talk about this young man. Oh, oh, him. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What about how, him? How old? I was nine. <laughs> nine. Yeah. Somebody drew this. No, what we did is, you know, we in the new technology, so oh, you can so take you a photograph and yeah. you can change it. Uh, he, he claimed that he drew it, but I'm much smarter than that. Uh, a good friend of mine, his name is Matt Alexander, um, he sent that back to me, and I was like, I have that same um, the app on my Mac. Uh, so, I, you know, but anyway, that picture was not <laughs> And if you see in that picture, I have my shirt buttoned up to the top. So when I was nine years old, every day, um, nine, ten, I had to wear a suit to school. Mm. Like I need, I wanted a, 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 a button-up shirt with a, with a jacket on every day. I had to wear. I don't know why. What made me, you know, it was obviously some images in my life that caused me to pick those that 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 path. But I used to. So I was a very neat um, young man. I used to wash my uh, clothes, iron my stuff before school, like for the whole week. Mm. Iron my socks. Iron my pants. I am my shirt. Are you a Virgo? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, all the so all those particular things, right? And um, it just it just made sense to me. Like I didn't want to be unprepared for things. Like and I just wanted to be in school on time. I really <laughs> love school. Um, I did not know that um, uh, that you know, growing up, we had music in my school as well. Let's talk about. I would share with that. We have yeah. music. We have music. You play an instrument? Of course, I play several. I play trumpet. Mm -hmm. uh, and they taught us how to read music. I play drums. Um, I play congos and bongos um, and things like that. Want, I wanted to play the saxophone and my teacher would never ever give me the saxophone. I just thought it was an incredible um, instrument and she and she gave me the trumpet so I learned how to play trumpet. Um, and then... Um, Did you go to a private school? No, no, it was public school. But wait, they said there was no music program. Well, it depends on where demographically where you were located, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if they were if they were breaking the uh, the system down, they hadn't reached my location yet. Which is in? Uh, in the South Bronx. Oh, 
I, I grew up, I'm, I'm from, um, from the South Bronx. I mean, all the pioneers of the culture. I would say, let's say legends, because they use pioneers so, yeah. so vague across the board. So I say the, the legends of hip hop were born, came from the South Bronx. And again, we were all people. We were we were in the race, we were in the color. Mm -hmm. um, and only when individuals grew up, they tried to separate themselves and classify themselves as a, as a particular race or, or, or color to, um, I guess, to gain the identity. When we were growing up, we didn't, we, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, that didn't matter to us, right? We didn't know what, who you were or what your family was, you were my friend. And I think that that kind of got away as we got older because everyone wanted to be identified with a particular culture or a particular race. Mm -hmm. And hip hop, um, at the initiation, it was about peak us. It was about us doing what we did, um, being um, expressive, um, just becoming like popular. So back to the back to collection. Yes. Back to the collection. Yes. Well, this is important because you know um, I collect because my mom collected. You know, she collected records, and so I'm trying to you know bring bring you back to your home base. And I mean, you, so are you saying South Bronx legends? MCs because well, I'm saying, is from the, the West Side, no? I mean, it's, it, I mean, again, again, we we live in a world where they create, um, now they create sectors and locations and stuff like that. As far as we're concerned, it was all the South Bronx, right? Whether he was up on that side of town, on this side of town, our state of mind and the way that we saw the world was that was the South Bronx. Now, you can say, oh, I was up in Jerome Avenue, I was on University Avenue, yeah, but as far as as a young man, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, we said South Bronx. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's not, you know, so that's why we call it South Bronx. But you can say I was in university. Um, my partner, JDL, here, um, when I say my partner, JDL, JDL is one of the most um, highly intelligent people that I've met in my entire life. Like, he is, his understanding of, like, life is, his vibration is kind of high. He's real yeah. smart, yeah. and he has great memory. And he's one of the co-pays brothers. That's right. Shout out. <laughs> Shout out to Jamie. And the lady who made that suit name is Maria Del Greco. Yep. What? Maria Del Greco, that's correct, who made this suit. Wow. From the Bronx. Oh, no, she wasn't from the Bronx. <laughs> she was from some, some other barrel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, so you didn't have any problems with the gang? Again. Um, that, that was in your neighborhood. I'll have bracing when you, this is how the culture was. like. Let's say, let's say the Bronx culture. If you went to school, if you played the sport, you got a pass. Mm -hmm. they, they honored what you did. Right? They didn't pull you into a game uh, unless you weren't doing anything. Right? They said, you need to be part of us. Mm -hmm. But if you had a specialty, if you went to school every day, they honored your parents. They could be standing here. They could be cursing. As soon as your parent walk up, they stop. Mm -hmm. They helped them with the groceries, they helped them upstairs. Like, so the understand, they had issues with other gangs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they didn't have issues with the community, they didn't have issues with our parents. They actually, if they saw you doing something wrong, they would take you and bring you home and tell your parent, this is what you're doing. So they were kind of like, it was a, it was a, it was a large family, so they never had a problem with any gangs, even when, um, when they, but when they started taking people lead jackets, because at the time you couldn't wear a lead jacket because they would take your lead jacket. And I remember walk, we were we were trick or treat trick or treat trick or treat in that day, and I had a lead jacket. And um, I was walking up Eagle Avenue, and they were coming down. I was like, you know, I don't know a lot of them. I was like a little kid, like 12, 11, 12, you know. And they saw you. It was like, now nah, leave Shorty alone. <laughs> they just honored you in a different way. They had they had a code of the street. They only, they only, they dealt with each other and they honored like the families in their community. This is why it's so important to get the oral history from the person that was there because mm -hmm. they've been vilifying the gangs and, you know, the South Bronx for such a long time. I mean, think, think about uh, this. Our vision of beauty was different than other people, right? Mm -hmm. the, according to this, Statistics of the world, the South Bronx was being burnt. Mm -hmm. Abandoned buildings. We didn't see any, we didn't know any other than that. So we didn't see it as being something decadent or something out of the ordinary. It was what we, when we got up in the morning, we walked out, we saw cars that 
They weren't on fire, but they were. <laughs> their, their, their will, their car, the um, tires were taken off. Their cars were abandoned, um, and we made it through school. We played in those bacon lots. We played hot peas and butter. We played softball. We played stickball. We played all those things, and we survived. Right? We survived those things. And um, I would, if I had a choice right now in my life, I would go back to ten years old and live there for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's how wonderful my life is and was. Mm. Okay. Uh oh. How old are you here? I think I was maybe sixteen or seventeen. And you discovered a style. You you got your D belt. Well, that's you know, that's the Cochrist time right there. We were coming into our own, and that picture was taken of Michael Angelo, um, uh, right off Link, near Lincoln Lincoln uh, uh, Hospital, and we you know we started making a few dollars. Remember, a few dollars was like. Um, you can buy your own jeans, you can buy your own sham shirt, you can buy your own hat. Um, my, I had seven sisters, so two of my sisters used to braid my hair. So, <laughs> out of my hat. Um, and, we, and at that time, name belts was really popular. Yes. And when I went to buy my letters, I always liked when they spelled out totally. E-A-S-Y-A-D. And they didn't have all the letters, and plus it was, it, it was cheaper to just purchase an E, or Z, and A, and a D, so that's what I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that says D, E, E. Yeah. So I had an easy A, D belt, D, E, E, and we used to clean it and everything, and that was part of the style at that time. When did you start rapping? When did I start MCing? MCing. Okay, so um, I, really, I really can't pinpoint a time, like a date and a time. I just know that um, I grew up in Ho Avenue Boys Club, that 1665 Ho Avenue, which had a lot of uh, people influence what I did and how I lived my life. Um, and my partner, my first MC partner, his name is Donald D. Donald D. Mm -hmm. You may know him from Rhyme Syndicate. Mm -hmm. um, he went out to LA. Um, and my first DJ was DJ Rashid. He was also uh, from the island of Jamaica. And we just started doing shows in the community um, and dollar parties. And, you know, it was just, I don't know, we, it was just something that it was organically correct. It was organically, it organically happened for me. To the world, like it was no one said, Oh, you're an MC. You, you play basketball, you're an MC. Flow, uh, did the outside parties, and they were crowded, you know. And then all of a sudden, it became popular in your community. It was like it, they said, Ghetto Superstar, but we just said we was popular. Everybody knew who you were when you walked in the lap lunchroom. They go, Oh, that's so and so. And you walk to the store, they say, So so. You got like perks mm -hmm. as, as being one of those people as well. I mean, being appreciated by what you did. Mm -hmm. This is Tony Tone. Oh, okay. Doing <laughs> that's uh, in the picture with me in there. That's uh, DJ Tony Tone. So Tony Tone is the founder of the Culpers Brothers. He's the person who came up with the name. He's the person who put everyone together. Uh, Tony Tone. I met Tony Tone. Tony. I said Tony Tone. I'm an MC. He said you're down. And then he said. Then he went on and started collecting the other members of the group. Um, and so that's how it happened. And um, that's the other members of the group. Um, in that picture, you have a uh, Tony Tone in the front, um, and the guy, by, the guy bicycle that we're on, KG. So KG used to ride his bike everywhere. Uh, a form of transportation before it was modern day, where everybody ride bikes. Now that's in the 80s, like 81, 80, like 81, right there. So in that picture is DJ Tony Tone, um, DJ Charlie Chase, um, JDL, Almighty KG, uh, Kaz, and myself. And that, take, and that picture was, was taken in the Bronx. How was the energy during that time? Like, what was going on in New York City? What was it like? Well, um, I think we, it, I'm going to share, but we lived in like a bubble, right? So we were like, we were protected from all the elements that was negative. Mm -hmm. We only saw accolades when we traveled. People gave us, they, they gave us accolades. But at that particular time in the Bronx, um, um, I think the Bronx was um, in, um, the city was in bankruptcy at that time, I, I, I think, from my, my memory is still mm -hmm. right. And it was going through a tra transition where um, uh, the president had just visited Charlotte Street um, and he claimed that, he said that he was going to clean it up because Charlotte Street was like a, a large section of the Bronx where there was nothing but abandoned buildings mm -hmm. and he pledged that he would come, give, not he would come, he came and saw it and he said that they, they would give money to build it up. Uh, they did many, many decades later. It wasn't that president, but it was a different president. Mm -hmm. And so it was, at that time, um, it was a lot of uh, 
a lot of poverty, if I can share that word, mm -hmm. um, economically, uh, families, or a lot of families are on, on public assistance. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't see it that way. Mm -hmm. Again, we didn't see it that way. I, well, I, I, I didn't see it that way. Mm -hmm. um, I never went to bed hungry. Um, I love, I love living. Like I love living. I went to school every single day, even when I was sick. Mm -hmm. They had a, my my parent my parents had to make me make me stay home <laughs> because I would go to school and they'd be like, oh you gotta come home and no I'm, oh, I'm okay I'm okay I'm okay I just love school because it was it was just so much fun in school we had so much fun um, we had teachers that actually really cared about their students it wasn't like it, we didn't know as a, remember as a kid you don't know that that's, that's their job mm -hmm. you think that the teacher just popped out and became a teacher, you know what I mean? <laughs> you, know, you know, and when, so we had like career day at our school, we had people come to our school, and our elementary school, um, uh, uh, Como's father came there, mm -hmm. um, Pele came to my school, um, Percy Sutton came to my school, um, and who else? Um, so we had people, people that come to our school that now, when you grow up as an adult, you're, oh, that's so-and-so, so, so. But we had a lot of people who come to, came to the school, they gave us speeches like sitting as a youth on the side watching adults talk. You can tell the adults that really care about you, yeah. right? Because as a young person, you have a, you have energy, you have a vibration. So did they, mm -hmm. you know. And so we love our teachers. I remember my, my fourth grade teacher. Her name was Miss Webster. Um, I I just thought she was like one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. And I, I I'm saying a woman as an adult male, yeah. but as a kid, a beautiful lady. Mm -hmm. Um, she always wore like um, long skirts and they were blue. And she had a white like shirt tucked in. It was mm -hmm. just perfect. Uh, she had black hair. I guess that's a brunette. Is it called that? Brunette. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, she never had any problems in her, in her class because she vibrated really well with the kids. Um, she would give you merits and demerits based on your participation or how good you were. So of course I. In my mind, I always set a, I set a state that when I'm going to do something, I don't share with everybody. I share with myself as I'm going to do it. So um, I got the most merits. So at the end of the year, she would go shopping. And I don't know where she was shopping at, but she used to bring in two tables full of items that you can you can use your stuff to buy. Mm -hmm. So baseball cards, basketball, all the things that were happening, comic books, right? So I had to go last because I had the most. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, so I used to tell the students, like, please do not pick the baseball cards. Because mm -hmm. that's all I wanted. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they went. And I used to get like maybe uh, maybe like two thousand baseball cards at that at that and I still have that you collection. Still, oh. Oh. I have I have about I have about maybe ten thousand baseball cards. Yeah. Ooh, ten thousand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, back then the times were different. I mean, I saw flyers that have parties on December 25th, Christmas Day. <laughs> school was open. The parties were in a school. Well, 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 back then what we did is we, we you had the janitor at the school mm -hmm. and you make a deal with the janitor. School wasn't open, but school was open for the party. Mm -hmm. So you make a deal with the janitor, pay him X amount of dollars, and you can have your party. So we have a lot of them. I just want, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bring up some of my, yep. my flyers now. Um, yes. So. So I have the, the Ecstasy Garage one. All right, all right, so you can, you can bring that one up. Yep. Um, we have uh, Anthony Riley who did can the I, flyer. Can I, 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 Mm -hmm. Right, so this is A Riley. Oh, no, no, this is the one. No, no, I'm saying right here. Oh, this one, one. Yes. the next one. There you go. Mm -hmm. That's the flyer right here, A Riley. And when I, I met with A Riley a couple of months ago last summer, uh, I was showing this to him. He didn't seem excited about it, but I was like, I have a flyer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the interesting thing about that is one time I went to the Black Expo and we was online and he was with his son. Mm -hmm. And he was like, hey, ED, how you doing? I'm A Riley. You may not remember me. I was like, okay, well, if you think I don't remember, that's fine, but I know who you are, blah, blah, blah. He said, did you tell my son that I was a big deal? <laughs> you know, doing flies. I said, absolutely. And so, you know, that was crazy. So this is one of the flies in my collection. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what else we have here? We have oh, that one. That's a, 
That's a phase two flyer, so this I have that flyer here too. <laughs> and if it's okay if we could share it? Absolutely, cool. you can test it, because that's in plastic. So okay, we can look at it. <laughs> Pass it around JDL, to make sure nobody jogs out the door. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a phase two flyer, that's a plastic flyer. Uh, the reason why I like that flyer, because it's so detailed. Mm -hmm. It's like he drew that, it's, it's, it's prestige, like the lines and everything. And for those of you who don't know what, what flyers are, this is how we promoted our parties back then. No social media. No social media. We brought up fly, our, our parties with flies, and that fly is a classic fly. I was walking on 125th Street, and the guy was selling this fly, and he blew it up. He was like, excuse me, can you take a picture with, with, with the fly? I said, absolutely not. <laughs> and the reason why I say that is because people don't value what you bring to something, right? They want you to do something for free. If you're my friend, we grew up, I'm going to do it for free. Right? But if you're someone selling something that I'm and then you want me to promote it and you're not, mm -hmm. it just doesn't work. It's not, it just doesn't mean, it doesn't register for me. So I said, no. He's like, oh, why you want to do that? I said, because aren't you selling that? Right. Yeah. Said, so you sell it and I'm not going to, you know, uh, I'm not going to talk about that. By the way, Cisco kids with the drawing. Cisco did the drawing. Is it a collaboration? It's right here. They're both together. Cisco yeah. did the drawing right there. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I did it together. Cisco, for those of you who are here in the voice in the back, <laughs> background. So Cisco did the drawing, and Buddy did the. No, Faze did the. I mean, Faze did it. I mean, Faze did it. All right, there you go. What else we have there? We have oh, 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 there you go. Oh, well. Oh, well. Oh, well. I need to find that fly in there. That's a classic, classic. Yes. You have to excuse me. I get excited about sharing information with people. Uh, all right, so this is a flyer. This is. Remember, all my flies is from the original run. These are not. I didn't go to a, a, a printing machine. Mm. This is from 1981, July 3rd. So let's talk about the flyer. Mm -hmm. All right, so in the flyer you have, A. Roddy was involved with this right there, right. Mr. Roddy is here. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And incredible, so this is, this is one of the, this is the first group battles in, in, uh, in hip hop. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say first group battles, like there was a lot of battles that was created on flyers. Mm -hmm. But those battles didn't happen. Mm -hmm. This battle happened in 1981, and right now you can probably purchase a, a, a cassette tape or a CD or MP3 of this particular show. Um, and I do have the suit. I think you have it right there. Can you bring that? The suit right there? Yep. Bam. Boom! <laughs> that is the suit that I wore that I wore at the battle, and I do have that suit at you home. You still have that suit? Absolutely. <laughs> I, that's, I, that that's, is a pinstripe suit, mm -hmm. um, and it was uh, 1981. That's upstairs. Side, side view. And that hat is a straw, straw hat, like how the gangsters wore it back. And so our show was called Gangster Chronicles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because we had the lyrical machine guns. Mm -hmm. um, we had on the shoes. So that's 1981 at Harlem World. Harlem World is a... Um, a multi entertainment complex on 116th Street and Lenox mm -hmm. Avenue. Um, we packed that place many times. We made up people a lot of money mm -hmm. at Harlem World, and we made um, we made history. That is the infamous battle. Um, in the in the room, we lost the battle. Mm -hmm. Hey, listen, don't 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 feel. But after that tape went circulating around us. It was like, no, no, no. cold crust. Cold crust. Yeah. And that's what it's all about, it's the people. The people always um, vibrated for the culture of hip hop. What do you have Oh. So, yes, a lot of school concerts, um, battles, and boys and girls clubs, too. Right, so we did a lot of community, uh, uh, and the community was open to, for us to have shows. That's, that picture was taken at Norman Thomas High School. Mm -hmm. That's the cold crust for and the Chester Street. And actually, I made that flyer. That's right oh. there. I created that one, too. Nice. Um, and um, we Riley, had... Riley wasn't a man. No, he wasn't. No, it wasn't. <laughs> After a while, you just... Um, you just learn how to do that. Like, you know, just like everything else. You learn how to do it. So that was... The Chester Street was like our, our friends. Show the one that with the stencil, because they think... Oh, that yeah. One. So that's what it is. You, you collected both... Oh, the flyer and the stencil. The flyer and the stencil. Okay. So this is, if you, this is, uh, where's that flyer that I was going around? around. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, this is the actual stencil and is signed by Mr. Buddy Esquire. All right. Uh, 
No, it's a, it, it's amazing. I mean, I'm sitting here and I'm staying. I'm standing over here. I'm like, that is amazing. This is from 19 what? 81. This will this will be passing this around. But anyway, this it has it has the price on it and what it, how it's made. You can take a look at that. Why do you have Why do you have that? Why do I have that? Well, because you said you told me that you paid for the flyer. Mm -hmm. you, that's why he gave it to you. He gave it to me. If I'm saying, did you pay for the actual flyer for that? Yeah, I paid for everything. Yeah. yeah. And he gave it to me because um, Buddy was just Buddy was just a cool dude. Like Buddy wasn't Buddy was brought in. Buddy Esquire was brought you into. Have a picture of him. Right, right. That's me and okay. Buddy. That's when I was a little bit older than I am now. You see how, <laughs> how I get younger every year. It goes on. You see how I get? All right. So yeah, Buddy was brought into the Buddy Esquire was brought into hip hop by uh, DJ Tony Tone. Mm. Tony Tone brought Buddy he, Buddy Esquire into. So he used to do the flyers for Brothers Disco. And here's the actual um, the flyer. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I have a, I, I, I just, it's just, I mean, your history, I mean, who doesn't love their history? Yes. I love it. This is, this one is my favorite. Oh, thank you. This is my favorite oh. flyer. So that was the a... The Rapper's Academy Award. All right, so, I mean, after a while, everybody started doing award shows, right? Awards, they wanted, because they, they figured they could, they can get the MCs to come in for free. Mm -hmm. right? So they don't have to pay you, and all the people will be there. Yeah. But every time we walked into any award, show mm -hmm. or a MC contest, they normally gave us our money. Like mm -hmm. like for the groups, mm -hmm. it wasn't really like we, we won already. We just went it was like a performance. So they used to give us our fee, we get on and we leave. Mm -hmm. And this was one of those. That was one of them. That was I think that was at what that's at Britain? Yeah, Britain High School. Oh wow. Okay. So you also have a book collection. Yes. Okay. So the first one that we have here is the Jim Freaky, Charlie Acorn uh, oral yeah. history project. So, um, in in the two thousands, um, um, what's the other gentleman from that worked with uh, Bill Gates to help Bill? Steve, Steve, Steve Jobs. Jobs. Steve Jobs, right? No, no, no. no oh, work with him. No, the other guy yeah. from Seattle. Uh uh He helped build um, Dell. Oh God. I don't know. Anyway, he owned, <laughs> he, he, um, they built a museum in Seattle called the Experience Music Project. Oh, oh. So when you fly over it, it was it was shaped like a guitar oh. because it was dedicated to Jimi Hendrix. Tony Tone actually helped put that book together. And you're going to hear Tony Tone name a lot because he is the person that a lot of people really don't understand. Right? When, you, when you talk about wow. class, when you talk about um, Herc, you need to talk about you need to add Tony to that mix. His his history is box. He helped put that to, uh, together. We actually went out there to kick off the big exhibit, um, and uh, Lance uh, Lance Marset was there. Um, the guy from uh, Ghostbusters was, that lives in Brooklyn. What's his name? He's Dan Aykroyd. Um, Beck was there. So Beck, those of you, so it was a collection of everybody. So we we were having breakfast. And Beck was like, you know, I got I to come over and talk to y'all. I was like, Beck, like, what do you know about hip hop? He said, listen, I was sitting in back in this interior watching y'all. That's why I'm where I'm in today. So y'all don't, when you do hip hop, has injected a lot into a lot of people that you don't even, you don't even know. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, Tony Tone helped with that book, Jim Fricky, um, Seattle Experience Music Project. We had a good time out which, there. Yeah, which is now the Museum of Pop Culture. It's they renamed it, mm. and Tony Tone's um, speakers, which are huge, <laughs> huge, um, are at the Universal Hip Hop Museum. So he donated those. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not into donating. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted, It seemed like he didn't have space in the. <laughs> he didn't have space in his, in his garage. Yeah, in his, in his home. They take them. Yeah, take them because they're huge. They're huge. They're, they're pretty much take the whole. They were actually the. I think they were the base models that was at the Roxy. Mm -hmm. oh. so that's that was a yeah. Believe me, Tony Tone is an incredible human being. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Okay, these are some other books. I never saw this Wild Style book. Well, that Wild Style book is, you know, for those of us who had the opportunity to travel to Japan, mm -hmm. uh, um, that's a book that they put together, like, for Japan. It was written in, in Japanese, stuff like that. I do have that uh, in my collection as well. How many books? I have one, because I had two, and, uh, and this guy was like, yo, let me, I want to show this to somebody. And he took it, 
and I never saw him again. So I was like, I think I was, so I was a teenager then. Like, mm -hmm. I saw him as I was a, a man, like many decades later. I said, yo, dude, <laughs> yo, you have my book, man. And what's up with my book? He's the only way that book is. I said, you lucky that I'm, I'm, a, I'm an honorable human being because I, I would, I would uh, squeeze the water out of you. <laughs> Oh, I, I, don't, I, I, haven't, um, I haven't done that due justice yet. Yeah, but yeah. it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> okay, so exhibitions. Well, actually, let's go back to the Schomburg. Okay. So what made you go into the Schomburg and say, hey, you guys need to create a hip-hop collection? Well, what the I did first is, one. Oh, first one, yeah. So I was, I was, it's a lot of people who really don't like hip-hop. They just tolerate hip-hop. There's a lot of institutions around the world that really don't like hip hop, but they tolerate hip hop. So, um, I, I, I walked past the Schoenberg decades, went into Schoenberg. I was like, how do you have an institution for black history or black studies and you don't have anything about hip hop? For years I kept saying that, years I kept saying that. So Howard Dawson, who is the, uh, he was the director, he was about to retire, you know, at that particular time. He was in a couple more years. So. He wanted to do a legacy, legacy for you know, for, and he wanted to bring hip hop in. So I was like, Yo, let's make it happen. So Octavia Pratt and um, Stephen Fuller uh, spearheaded that. We sat down, we had a meeting. It was just me and them at first, and um, I was like, listen, we have to do this. It was like, well, we don't have any money. I was like, well, you need to go find some money <laughs> um, because you have people that donate to the Schoenberg all the time, right? They do collections and stuff like that. So let's make this happen. Then I brought in two other members to help make this happen. That was the first. So that's how I brought it. I was going to do it alone, but I am not a solo artist, meaning that I don't play tennis, I don't play golf, I play team sports. So I brought in other people to assist to make it happen. We kicked it off. It was the first. We had a, um, a also a sit down. We talked about it. I brought in some uh, people like Dougie, talked on it, and and me and some other people. And that was like the last time that my mother actually got a chance. She didn't, didn't come and see. Uh, what you know? What I, what I, what, I, what, I, what the evolution of what I've done because she did come see us one time um, at the boys' club when we played at Ho Avenue um, Boys Club, and uh, our, my, our parents came. Tony Tone mom came, my mother came, and it was interesting when the parents rolled up and say it was like maybe maybe um, 150 people outside, mm -hmm. cramming to get in the door, and they said, "Well, Easy AD mother is here," and they opened up. So it's a different, like now they have respect mm -hmm. for people and respect for things back then more, more than they have now. Yes. Anyway, so that was, in that particular picture, they had an exhibit uh, that was in uh, Brooklyn. It was an incredible exhibit, um, and that picture was life-size on, on the wall up there. So it was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, and I took a picture by it, and then some kids and their parents knew who I was. And they said, that's him in the picture. And I was like, yes, that's me. That's my partner, Almighty KG. That picture was taken, um, split apart. That picture was taken at South Bronx High School in 1979. Um, because um, I told my coach that we don't want to play on these backboards. And I'm going to have a party at the school. And we're going to buy the school, buy the last backboards and our uniforms. And he looked at me like I was crazy. But then, at the end of the night, mm -hmm. when the party was over, he, he was like, money. he had the money. We got oh, our uniforms uh. and we got our fiberglass backboards. Yes. And that, that picture right there also was in the movie CD4 by Chris Rock. Oh, oh uh, okay. So when it comes on, first comes on, that's the picture that he shows. Uh, sorry, AD. Oh, did you know that? Mm -hmm. no, no, no. Okay, there you go. Okay, now, now. <laughs> no. AD, oh, can I ask a question? What, what year was that event where your parents came? Um, I think it was 1981. Okay. okay. Um, well, the to go back to the Schomburg, that collection was started in 1999. I, I don't honestly no. Uh, I don't know what year, but I, that's I, what they claim. That's what I did with my paperwork. Yeah. Um, and so what I did is we did we did the show at the Schomburg. Then what I did is I brought in some things to let them copy it and add the collection. Did they the oral history? So they got the oral history collection. So people go in there now they do their research on hip hop and. I played a very intricate part of that, and, and, and it's at the Schoenberg. That's a big deal. You know, I'm yes, thinking. Yes. Of, I'm thinking about this, and I, I'm, you know, that was almost 24 years ago. So that's like half of hip hop's history. <laughs> Nobody was collecting, right? 
institutions. And so most of the artists kept all of their belongings, right? All of the th their collections. So um, now I can see why people are like, well, I have three storage units of things mm -hmm. because nobody cared about the culture. But that changed. So this, this exhibit, tell me about this. That was my second exhibit. So after the first exhibit, I wanted to have an exhibit, an exhibit every year. That's in the Aaron Douglas room. Um, they have a famous painting at the YMCA at 135th Street. Mm -hmm. um, look up the history of Aaron Douglas, they'll tell you the history. So I did the exhibit there. Um, and we just brought our photographs, not just, we brought photographs, flyers, and you see on the wall, mm -hmm. there's some of my flyers that are not in here, and we, there's only one of them um, that I had, and we, they put it in frame. So we took some of the, after the exhibit at the Schoenberg, they gave me all my stuff, so I was able to use it at those places. Like so, when you look back here, that's one of the posters that I have, and that's in that picture right there. That's mm -hmm. um, from Broadway's National. That's 1983. Um, so that was cool. So you've been in movies. You've been in. Uh, that's a, that sounds so corny. Uh, <laughs> you've been in movies. You've, been, you know what you've, mean? you've traveled the world. Yeah. What what? Any experiences? from the tour that you want to share? Well, um, I would say, like, tour, the, the movie Wild Star went on tour in 1983. So we went, we were the first, and, I, and, I, and you know, everyone uses the word first, so we were, I would say, the injection of the culture outside of America, mm -hmm. in, nice. okay, All right. in Japan. So we went to a place where they didn't speak no English, they didn't know anything, no one knew about hip hop. The movie came out, we performed there, we were there for like 17 days, something like that. We went to Osaka. We rode the bullet train, which th people think is exciting now, but we did that back then. Mm -hmm. Most of the technology that they have in America now, they had it in Japan back then. Mm -hmm. It was so incredible. The doors opened by itself. We didn't touch the door. No thing, not all those things. But the most exciting thing is about it, we went to this particular park in, um, in Japan. And everybody used to dress up as Elvis. When we got there, everybody, there was Elvis Presley, people dancing with Elvis Presley. When we left, it was B-boys and B-girls from that point on. Every, from that point on. We, um, we also um, partnered up, I think, with the number one, uh, the biggest store like in Japan. It's called Seibu. I think Seibu. I think that's the name of the store. It's like Macy's over here. It's the biggest store over there. We, we did some you know, contests. Um, and the number one uh, comedian, his name is Tamari. We did some big stuff with him. Uh, so we did, we did a lot. Uh, and it wasn't just, it was a group of us. Uh, Graph writers, B boys and B girls, DJs and MCs. And actually, I wore this suit in Japan, and I had on a Wild Style shirt, which I still have. Uh, I still have it that I wore with the suit, and I have the red boots. So can I? Yeah, that was just a yeah. I have one more. Show us. Show us. I have one more. What is, this is a treasure trove right here. Um, what is this all about? Not gonna catch him wearing those red boots now. No, no, no. I mean, hip hop. Fashion changed quite a bit. Uh, oh, <laughs> look, you went from leather to jeans. This, this is a jacket. That's, that's, that's classic. Why, why you look so sad over there? Because you really want this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we have KGs. That's all. He's got all that stuff. He's, 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 you have KG, yes. Almighty oh, KG, if you watch it, mine is specific. It looks like it just was made. <laughs> this is right here. This is, this is like, and this, actually, this this particular item is, um, we took a print picture with, I think, Chris Rock. Um, and it's um, in the sword. In the sword, that's in there. Yeah. And here's the, here's the pants. Um, who did the art, um, you, you want to, I can you tell want you right here, it's right here. His name is Wayne. Because again, artists used to sub, they sign their stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's right here on the left. Mm -hmm. Right here, see? Hey, where'd you go? Like Astro Plays? Like yeah. Right Astro Plays. So, yes, so this was built 1990, and the year was 1991. Right? Mm -hmm. Incredible. So those are the things that I mean, I think that, you know, I always have. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Well, now you are a <laughs> historian, 
So I miss, I miss that. Um, but, oh, I'm sorry, this is a picture of me. Uh-huh. Uh, looking like Nipsey, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> um, you forget those things. Um, but um, some of us as adults, we never grow up, right? And I, when I say grow up, I'm an adult male. Is that the job? Yes, it is. It is. Mm-hmm. I'm, an adult, it is. I'm an adult male, but I am 10 years old every day. Like, I'm, a ten, I'm a 10 year old kid walking around acting like an adult, and that's how it works for me. So by, by working with young people, I'm working with my, I'm working with my peers. I just have more experience than people. <laughs> um, young people that I work with, or I do program with, um, they are, I took a book for them, right? Um, I'm, I'm, so I took the program, I do a program at Simon right here, it used to be my partner, we worked at Columbia, we got this for many years. <laughs> So um, we did um, we did stroke, hip hop stroke, hip hop heels, mm-hmm. uh, old school, um, and initially when when they had hip hop stroke, there was no hip hop in it. It's just a hip hop stroke. So mm-hmm. I, I came in and I brought the hip hop meaning hip hop. I brought the like, we changed the visuals. Um, we added the music. We added the graffiti type style, mm-hmm. um, and on top of that. They were using paper to ask the kids questions. And I was like, that doesn't work for me. I was watching Oprah. I said, they use devices. We need to get some devices like that for the kids. And then we bought some audio response devices where um, the kids were to use it. So the program, um, the kids are interactive at all times. We give out prizes. It's, it's called entertainment. It's like... We get 500 kids signing the chair. That we <laughs> we we'd be in the auditorium with 500 um, third, fourth, and fifth graders on fire. Mm-hmm. Education, vibration, talking about making healthy choices. And I think that if you, when when you vibrate with the young people around the world, you never, you will never, you will never die. You will never get old. Um, your brain will always be working because they are. They are, they are the world. They are incredible. They are honest. They share their life with you. They trust you. And um, so I've, I've been doing that since 2007. Wow. And so I've, I've, I'm seeing all the kids. I'm going to go to all five girls getting out of, out of New York City. Yeah. And the interesting thing about that is that some of the kids are like maybe married now. They have kids and they still, when they see you, mm-hmm. like I see them, mm-hmm. they go, hey, you can't go to school. And this program that you're talking about, Hip Hop Stroke, actually is the first partnership with a non well, yeah, non profit organization with a hospital. Right? The first one in the country to um, integrate hip hop as a learning tool to teach about stroke and it actually reduced the amount of Victims who suffer from stroke because they taught young people to uh, about the symptoms, mm-hmm. right? And then they went home and they nagged their parents about it. Um, yes. And we know there was a study on there was a study on television um, that I was watching it was on PBS called Nagging. And they <laughs> know what it was a study where kids can nag their parents to do anything. They mm-hmm. nag them, and the parents will do anything, mm-hmm. and it works. So yes. we call it. So the kids would go home and tell their parents, like, um, you should be eating that. Oh, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Mm-hmm. And then, remember we had that hot round where the kids would call in? Yes. <laughs> they would call in and say, the kids would call in, they went, they, the kids went off the hook, they had, they had to disconnect the hot round. Right. The kids would call in and say, well, AD or so-and-so, um, yeah, um, my, my dad or my mom don't want to stop smoking. Yeah. Yeah. So, so complaining, we, reporting, <laughs> reporting. 
Huh? Not complaining, reporting. Yeah, reporting. We empowered the kids to make the parents change, and it did, and it did. So there's something called TPA, TPA, when so, right? Yeah, yeah. And top bus will be cold, so if right. you get a person who's having a stroke or a, a, a dry stroke, meaning that it's a blockage, yeah. they get into the hospital within like 30, 20, 30 minutes of that feeling, they can use just this TPA, push it in your body, mm -hmm. and it'll clear the clock. So we did, we had a young man who saved someone's life. Good, a couple, like a lot of them. <laughs> and they recognized their parent was having a stroke, right. and they told the other parent, um, I think your dad is having a stroke. He said, how do you know? Because I was still at school. His, his face is slurred. He got very good, good uh, vision. Mm -hmm. You need to call me out one. And that's it. So that's just another part of my life yeah. um, that uh, it just, it's just, it's just, it's just, like, what else could you possibly do if you're, if you're not, if you're not engaging young people, like, I see people like the kids say, first of all, you still look the same. Like, what are you going to look like? I said, no, I told you when I met you, you're going to catch up to me. <laughs> I, tell them, I tell them, they'd be like, okay, 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 what are you doing? I said, it, it's not what I'm doing. I live, I live a life where, um, like, things matter, right? What matters to me? Water. What matters to me? Um, being honest with myself, being that I, I don't expect the, most people to like who I am because. I don't fit a narrative in that. Like, I'm not going to be part of your program, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are like, which program have you picked? I picked the other programs that you are familiar with. Mm -hmm. right? I created a program that works for me, um, and I, I helped. I shared it with some people, and it worked for them, and they could sense like, yeah, it works. It works if I do it, you know, like that. And I think that we spend our life figuring out all the things that we don't like. I don't spend my life doing that. I spend my life doing the things that I like. Well, you've been recognized by um, President Obama, and you know that's really beautiful that that your work is making a difference. Now, tell us about the reading program because I know you 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 um, oh, yeah. so, got Pete to join yeah. you for a reading. So it's called um, Our Kids Read. Is uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, his name is Jamal Lake. He's director of Our Kids Read. So this past summer, um, they teamed up. We teamed up, and I'm a part of it. We teamed up with the uh, New York Public Library. Where a donor gave uh, 250,000 books for us to distribute, not us, but like other programs to distribute to young people around the city. So he called me because he was like, oh, I can't do that. I said, You can't do what? I said, That's easy. He said, Really? For you it is. I said, All right, what do you want to do? So I made all the calls, set up different things, and we we went in, and someone would read a story. Uh, so I, my first initial pro, uh, thing that I did, I read a story about Serena and her sister. Uh, Venus, uh, and uh, I didn't really have to read the book because I know their history because I met them at Home um, Signal in 1997 um, when they were younger, at 14. They followed one of them because they have the Tennis Association in Harlem, and they brought them in. It was raining that day, so I, you know, I, I was the summer camp director at Jackie Robinson's in the Harlem Line. See, I brought all 400 kids over there to meet them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I read the book, talked about reading, then each kid get a chance to uh, pick three books. And all the books are um, culturally connected to the kids that we're giving out. Right? And so they get three books, and it's separated based on their grade, grades. Grades, mm -hmm. kindergarten, first, second, third. And we did that for uh, a couple of months until all the books ran out. Well, just like that. And it's, yeah, because the kids want the books. It, you just have to set it up in a way that they can make selections. I, I, I can honestly share with you that. Uh, Beyond being a collector, I could, I'm, I'm a collector of souls, and uh, and I'm talking about young people. My connection with them will always be. I mean, no matter how old they are, uh, they will look at me as AD. I mean, they, they, they have kids. They walk down the street. I was also a gym teacher for I think ten years as well. So I taught gym PE, and so the kids I taught PE um, back in nineteen from nineteen ninety six. 96, yeah. I used to fast back then. I used to eat no meat, um, fast for 30 days, just more than women. Um, and they used to say, How do you do that? And I would say, Well, I do it because I need, to, um, I need my body to rest. I need my energy to go up. They said, Well, you don't get hungry. I said, oh, For the first 24 hours, it's not I'm hungry, I desire food. I get my body regulated. So, and I used to run exercise, I mean, train. Doing my 
about that. So how you do that? I said, your money has reserve. Yeah. You just have to know your level mm -hmm. uh, reserve and where you want to go. And that's, I'm learning every day from them. I tell them, I, I share with them that I do not know everything. She, I don't know everything. So you're going to teach me. I'm only going to share with you things that I think that are necessary. And uh, and I've been doing that all my life. So I mean, she had to tell you when we go into the schools, we don't tell the kids what to do. We share with them. Mm -hmm. And kids are so been around, they've been dictated to so much. They tired of that vibration with their parents tell them what to do. Everybody tell them what about what you want to do? Yeah. And when they hear you know, they be like, what excuse me? I said, Wait. they get excited because now they, they can really be free. And not, I'm not saying not to be a parent. I'm just saying to understand and switch the roles. You were a kid before and I think a lot of adults forget they were kids. Let's talk about this. And when we're creating hip hop, the adults used to shun what we did. They said, that, what are you doing with that music is not good? What is the hip hop stuff? It was like, that's why we didn't like the adults. They didn't honor what we were doing. Now, moving to 2023, it's the same thing happening across the board where hip hop pioneers like myself, and I'm not one of them, who shun the new artists. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. Yeah. Because it's our obligation to say, you know what? I, to like what you're doing, but I have to honor it, and I better understand what you're doing because we lay the platform for what you're doing, and you have a greater responsibility because you have a greater platform to do the things, and more people, you just, it's just more, it's more economics involved, and some people, did, we get to hip-hop because we loved it, right? Mm -hmm. Now people may get into hip-hop for different reasons, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And it's nothing wrong with that, but things change because of that. Right, so... Well, you, uh a space, we, we, but you in your programs and all that you do, you created a space for young people to thrive, yes. right? And we're celebrating Hip Hop's 50th, and we need to really, and right, right, forget about that, right? 50 years of Hip Hop. Let's get that yeah. 50! 50 years of Hip Hop. Now we have to pass the baton. So on that note, we're going to open it up for questions. Before, before we open that, I'm going to brag a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. This is, this is our first contract that we have signed. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it's only two pages. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, what what, what minute? No, it's not a recording contract. Oh. Yes, yeah, I have that. And so, I want to also share this. All right, so, um, Yvette D. Clark was the first person to give um, Dr. Mixer to hip hop artists. Mm -hmm. And I have the facts here, and I have the letter here. Mm -hmm. I'll pass that around. Mm -hmm. What year was that? Oh, you can see that. Uh -huh. I don't recall, I don't recall, sir. 2003. <laughs> I'm going to share this flag too. So, this particular flyer is from the skating room. Uh -huh. And as you see, it's the co brother and the Fantastic Five. You know, this is the first, this is when we teamed up and we did Fan Press 9. It was nine microphone stands, nine mics. Yes. Fantastic, went, they went first, they did a routine, then we did a routine, back and forth. And whoever has this tape here, it is incredible that you have this tape. I don't know, I don't have it. I would mm -hmm. love to have it. This is, when, this is the night. TL, you remember Fan Press 9? Yeah. There you go. He don't have the fly in this hand right here. I'm going to probably get the tape. All right, well, you need to get that for me. <laughs> Please get it for other people. Yeah. Any questions? Any questions? So thank you, thank you for your time. I'm just gonna put this stuff in my bag. So. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, you have a question. I just want to ask the media assassin. Have you ever? Have you really had to? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> AD, I just want to say I'm proud of you. 
and Michael Goody. He, he right. was just like you. I'm listening to you, man. You're amazing, man. Brother, you are amazing. And what, you, what you're doing, man, is incredible, man. Um, so I am starting a, uh, I'm starting a book series called I am Hip Hop Book Series, but it's going to be uh, for grades four, five, and six. And um, I have um, my illustrator in the house. He's going to be part of it. Uh, come on. Come on. So we, we, you know, anybody can tell you, I don't, I don't sweat nobody. I don't call you a hundred times. I, <laughs> I flow. You get me, you do things for me. I'm, I, I like it to come organically. And when it comes organically, that means you put it at a particular time. So Martha, she's she's worldwide and she's like worldwide not only in America, she's worldwide outside of America. She's done a lot. And one word that she uses is I don't have enough time. And I say this to you. <laughs> time is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. and you can you, you're super smart. Uh, I've known you for a long time. You have very good energy. Um, you're very honest, and you can do whatever you want. And that's for that's for real. So, uh, <laughs> and the lady behind me, the, 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 the okay. camera is Simon. Hello. Simon's a good friend of mine. We've been, we we work together, and uh, she can tell you. Simon can tell you that I'm straight forward. <laughs> uh, oh. And Simon also is going to do some movies. She does movies. She's been, she can talk about the movie. Oh. Okay. Yes, um, about the movie. So, uh, and actually, also, uh, AD is a producer on a movie because he always believes in anything I do. And it was the first movie I ever wrote. It's on Amazon. Okay. And, yeah, it's called King Lear Theory. And it is an adaptation of King Lear. It won Best Adaptation of the Chain. I don't know if they had other adaptations, but I'm not going to pull on that thread. I'm just going to accept the award. Um, but yeah, AD always believed in it. it. We did it during the pandemic. And AD, and everyone like AD was putting their faith in us. We didn't know what's happening in the early days of the pandemic. Nobody knew what's going on, but people were like, yeah, you're doing that? Okay, I'll get on the Zoom and read with you. I'll help you. Do you, you need to shoot somewhere? I'll be a background extra. Like, people were showing up. And so it, when I see that movie, it's just a labor of love. Because there's so many... I think the pandemic really showed us who's an AD and who's not. I mean, if that's a saying. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we're, we're on... Uh, COVID's still always going to be with us, and so we do want to keep safe, but the health emergency is over. But, I mean, it just it just shows good people are good people, no matter what's going on. And you don't know what's around the corner, but, uh, and I, I also have to say, I'm really proud to be the same age as hip-hop. Thank you. All right.